Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's July 17th. And I'm Frank Grace. It's the Wall Street Unplugged podcast. We're bringing the headlines and... Tell you what's really moving these markets. I told you Wednesdays. Can I start getting more interviews for you guys? Got a great one coming up today. It's with my buddy John Petrides, portfolio manager at Tocqueville Asset Management. I've seen him a lot, the media a lot, CNBC a lot, quoted a lot. And I know John for over 10 years, had him on a show numerous times. Uh, he's a fantastic analyst, someone who also challenges me, which I love because I love talking to smart people who have a different opinion than me. And you're going to see that in one part of this interview. We discuss, you know, mergers and acquisitions. Is Trump going to be better? Where we're going to see more M&A activity. He points out like a couple of good points of how we're seeing some strong M&A activity in one particular sector. But uh, we have a relationship where we go back and forth. We always want to get things right. But the most important thing, what I love about John is he's been right a lot when he's on the podcast, with his market calls, his economic calls. Uh, and in this interview, we're going to cover a lot of cool stuff. So we're going to cover uh, you know, what sectors to own in the second half of the year going into 2025, Fed cuts, which are probably on the way, which John says he really doesn't care about. <laughs> and it's a reason why, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and also, which I found very, very interesting, is the position they have in gold and how they continue to increase. I think it's one of the largest positions in gold. He's going to tell you why. And not for the reasons that you know everybody thinks, why you should own gold, but more fundamental. So great, great interview. Make sure, turn up those speakers. You're going to learn a lot. And let's get to that interview right now. John Petridis, what's going on, man? It's been such a long time. Uh, Frank, thanks for having me on. Congrats on the continued success with the show. Doing a great job. And um, so happy to be back. Man, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. It's uh, Like I said, it's been a long time. You are uh, uh, such a great guest. People always love getting ideas and things from you. And we go anywhere, right? And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to really talk about the markets. There's so much going on. Uh, and, and, you know, going into earnings season, we're not in the heart of earnings season a little bit in it, but, but I want to start off with the markets. Uh, mm. yeah, there's so much chaos. There's so much going on with the world. Yet you see the VIX at low levels. You see, it, it's almost like promoting risk taking. You would think higher interest rates would have resulted in the market pulling back, would have resulted in housing pulling back. And we have this mixed market that we're not used to seeing ever, right? Mm. With a high interest rate environment and makes it for a tough, you know, risk reward profile. What are your thoughts on the market? How are you playing this? And I guess after that, we'll get into the Fed and what you think they're going to do if it even matters. But uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on the market right here? Because there are people that are nervous, but we keep going higher and higher and hitting new records. Yeah. You know, I think if you if you look at the market as the S&P 500, mm -hmm. the market right now is not the market. I mean, we, we've discussed this a million times. You've discussed this a million times of how concentrated the S&P 500 is, you know, that you have a handful of stocks driving the whole ship and nothing else really matters, basically. And so, you know, there's this false sense of, wow, stocks are doing great because the S&P 500 is up, you know, wherever we are today, you know, between 10 and 15 percent, something along those lines. And remember, the S&P 500 is market cap weighted, meaning the larger the size of the company, the larger it dominates in, in the index, right? Mm -hmm. So the Apples and Amazons and Googles, all those are the top of the list because they are three, four trillion dollar type companies, which is just crazy to think about, by the way. Uh, it's just crazy to think about. Uh so what we like to look at is the equal weighted S&P 500. So there's an ETF out there, the RSP, uh, which says, forget the market cap, pound for pound, what is each stock doing on their stock price, their total return? And the equal weighted is up, you know, sort of low single digit type returns. And that's probably a better indication of when you're looking at how the economy's doing versus how stocks are doing than versus the stock market, which is driven by a few. So, so when you look at it pound for pound, what's the average stock doing? It's kind of up like low to mid single digit. And mm -hmm. that kind of feels right when you have interest rates at five and a half percent and the Fed trying to slow the economy. And we've been in five and a half percent interest rates for you know, a full year now. The economy is marinated in it. Uh, and and you're starting to see cracks form for sure. So what do you see going forward? Because you, you, you're looking at, like you said, it's having exposure to those, I mean, you can say 10 stocks, but it's really like five or six, right? 10 count for 38% ASP mm -hmm. 500. 
But those stocks and those names are, are driving earnings significantly, right? They're mm -hmm. all into the right trends in terms of AI, big data analytics. They're mm -hmm. all, you know, robotics and stuff, right? They're all into the right trends. They generate a massive amount of cash flow. They're actually laying off employees, which I've never seen in my 30-year career. Companies at all-time highs. But they're doing that because they're also not just increasing earnings, which you're going to do if you lay off employees temporarily, but they're increasing sales. That means they're showing more productivity. Mm -hmm. Do you have more exposure to these names? Are you selective with other names? Because when I look at the markets right now, what we've seen with Helena Troy, mm. this is a company that bought back uh, you know, $100 million worth of stock last quarter and, yep. and going through a restructuring plan and falls 30%, right? A consumer-related yep. stock that sells stuff, to, most of their stuff, 40% of the sales are like through Target, Walmart, stores like that. Even Salesforce, great company, gets wrecked. I mean, it seems like you know, what pockets and what areas are how you play in this? Because it seems like – you, know, you pick the wrong stock, you could be down 20, 30% in a day. And even if you pick the right one, it looks like outside of those top five or six, mm -hmm. that maybe if you get a company that reports good earnings and raises guidance, maybe you get like a five, 7% pop. It just seems like the risk reward's tough. But where are you looking right now? Because it seems in this environment, it, it's not as easy as it was, say, six months ago, nine months ago, at least from my point of view. So it, it, it's a great question. And there's a million ways to slice and dice it. Mm -hmm. I think the one good thing that or one of the good things about today's environment that we have that was not prevalent not present in 2021 and to a degree in 2022 is that i think investors are finally rewarded for being diversified meaning yes there has been a one horse race and you know uh in the past seven years there's essentially been one asset class that has dominated all the others mm -hmm. and that has been large cap us-based technology growth companies mm -hmm. right if you look at the returns there's essentially no comparison to anywhere else in the world and guess what that is a very crowded trade right now if, if you don't own you know shares of the mag 7 individually, I'll guarantee you, you own a lot of them through all the other mutual funds and ETFs throughout your 401k, mm. you know, in your investment portfolio, you own them somewhere. Uh, the whole world owns those stocks, right? So that means there has to be value elsewhere. So, you know, international developed countries, large cap international outside the US that sell globally is really, really attractive here, especially with all the political issues going on uh, in Europe. Uh, war, obviously, between Ukraine and Russia has scared some people away. You already have cost cutting, uh, uh, interest rate cutting going on in the European Central mm -hmm. Bank, which, hey, if if people are all excited about it on the US, why wouldn't you be excited uh, in, in Europe on that? You have Japan seemingly seems to be getting itself uh, turned around there from a positive inflation growth without having to manipulate the market as much as it has. So mm -hmm. I think – you know, uh, the U.S. growth story is very, very well known. Valuations are not as attractive. Fantastic companies, as you mentioned, generate a tremendous amount of cash flow, zero balance sheet issues, great trend in AI, all of that good stuff. But if you're playing the long game, there's a lot of value to be had in international. Small caps have been really left for dead. They've been massive underperformers. Small Terrible. cap stocks are Terrible. really, really interesting here. And you know what, Frank? I, I, I know you, the, you, your discussion is principally on the equity side of things. The bond market is finally investable. Mm -hmm. You are earning yield income above the rate of inflation for the first time in like 15 or 16 years, yeah, 17 yeah. years, right? It's so not a bad you, investment going it's into not a bad investment. And interactive you know broker's money market account. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. And, and, and if you, you want to be patient and you want to sit in the catbird seat and you had a little bit of cash sitting on the sidelines and it's picking up 4% in a money market fund, which was not happening from 2009 until 2023 – uh, you can have some there. So my point behind that is the way we look at it, and particularly my team, we have balanced strategies. You have some U.S. large cap. You should be buying or looking at international uh, developed. You should have some bonds. It's okay to have some cash. And for the first time in a long time, we think being diversified across multi-assets is attractive uh, and, and you could play it. So you don't need to be on one side of the boat, despite the fact that that one side of the boat continues to seemingly feel like it keeps going up into the right with no end in sight, which never ends well. Nothing ever goes up into the right forever. Yeah, I know. It's been a while, though. Right? I mean, we saw a downturn in 2022 temporary, but it seems like a downturn, especially since 
I yeah. would go back since dot com, right? I mean, that was a big downturn. That was three years, three years of seventy five percent decline over three years. Now, you know, with, with you know, I always said uh, John, the worst thing that happened to our government during the credit crisis, they made money on everything that they bailed out. They made mm -hmm. a fortune on it, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives them the okay to bail out everybody and everything now, and, mm -hmm. and just money goes behind everything. But even with COVID, what was it? Thirty days. You know, 2022, right. okay, right. we had a few months. But these right. downturns, they're severe, right. but they're so quick that people come in and, and buy stocks. And I guess, you know, staying with the international part, what specific countries does your team maybe at Tocqueville like the yeah. most? Because when, when I've heard the pitch for international for over 10 Forever. years, and it's been 100%. blowing up in everybody's face, I feel like, for most for the most part. When you, know, you have U.S. exposure, you have U.S. companies that generate I mean, you probably know the percentage better than me, around 40% of the, their, their yep. profits uh, overseas. Yep. But it just seems like, you know, even when we have inflation, even when we have high interest rates, this is terrible for, for other countries, right? Even though they're lowering rates, it's just terrible where we're able to pass off inflation to them. Uh, I agree with you. The valuations are great, but being very selective is not easy where owning ETFs is easy for, for different countries. But then you have to buy, you know, a bunch of stocks where guys like you... And me, you know, we look at individual names and, and could pick and choose. But how does an individual investor, maybe from the ETF yeah. side, play to what country? Yeah, so so it, it's a great question. And and you know, when you, the the issue with being a longer term investor is, it's like, well, what's the catalyst? Because we've been, you could look at something that looks cheap forever, like international. And you know, when you're looking at international stocks versus domestic, the strength of the dollar is usually the primary driver, and then it goes down into politics and all these other issues, and then it gets down to fundamentals, uh, you know, interest rates and all these other things before you get to uh, to to the pure fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's 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 your definitely developed Europe, uh, Japan again is starting is looking attractive, but it's not necessarily just. Uh, it's those companies that are domiciled there, but they sell globally, mm -hmm. right? That's what you want. Or that's what that's what we're looking for. It's those larger cap companies that are based in developed Western Europe, in Japan, that sell internationally and don't necessarily get all of their sales from their domestic country. And those typically that give back a big dividend. So, for example, uh, you, you know, we primarily our team specifically within uh, my team specifically within Tocqueville. Uh, buys individual stocks, buys individual bonds. But if we want international and or small cap exposure, we do utilize ETFs and some mutual funds. And there is a Vanguard high div international high dividend yielding uh, ETF, uh, v VYMI. I want to make sure I get that yet, right, where mm -hmm. it's international stocks, larger cap, where they have a high dividend yield. So you're, you're trading at a, at a discount uh, to domestic stocks and you get paid to wait uh, with, with with the dividend. So uh, that's an interesting way to play this theme. And, and within our you know individual uh, equity strategy, you lift up that hood. We're buying individual stocks you know, that fit that theme as well. So um, so 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 that that that's something where we're finding attractive opportunities for sure. Yeah, it makes sense. So so you talk about catalysts, right? And, and that's how I like to invest because value, cheap stocks get cheaper. What's the catalyst? What's the growth catalyst? Right. Is the Fed lowering rates a catalyst? Because let's face it, <laughs> we're waiting for a year, which you know we we we're, were ahead of it. We played it wrong. I, I think I thought the market was going to come down a lot more because in 2022, uh, you know. Just started raising rates, right? When we started raising rates, we saw the market come down. And, and I knew the Fed wasn't going to cut. It's just what they were saying, they weren't going to cut, especially 2% inflation rate. I don't know if we'll get back to that. Uh, and I'm like, they're not going to cut. And that was the basis for the bullish case in 2023. The Fed's going to cut. The Fed's going to cut. I never thought the Fed wouldn't cut and the market would be up the way the market surged right. the way it is. And it's even up now. And they still haven't cut. Right. Is this a big deal? Because you know everyone's been anticipating it. We didn't need cuts for the market to go up tremendously. Or is a cut going to be like, like, is that going to be the callus for a sell off? Maybe where, okay, now finally, you know, it, it's sell on a news event, but is this a callus something you're looking for? You're looking for the Fed to cut? Yeah. You know, going, going I think at this, at, yeah, I think at this point, and really the past six months or so, mm -hmm. five months, I, I've been feeling that, uh, you know, will the Fed cut and how much? Who cares? Right. And what I mean by that is the, 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 the important point of what the Fed is going to do is that they're no longer raising rates. Mm -hmm. And the economy has now slowed enough. And Powell, you know, spoke uh, last week that they're seeing enough evidence that the Fed is not going to need to raise rates, right? And the Fed does not want a 1970s Arthur Burns reboot of stop and start monetary policy. They want to make sure that when they cut, they're cutting, 
right? So that's number one. That's that's the point. It's not when will the Fed cut and you know 25 basis points here, 25 basis points. It's the fact, the big signal that they're no longer raising. All right. So that's part of the reason I think of why uh, equity markets are rallying is because they're saying, okay, we're done raising. Now what? Um, whether it's 25 basis points and whether it's in Jackson Hole at the end of August or the third week in September when they meet, or uh, you, you know, the Fed has a meeting, Frank, uh, the day after the election. Right, the day after the U.S. election, the Fed meets. So yeah. we're not going to have a president then, anyways. Huh? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that that's right. So, so you're. I, I'd be shocked if the Fed did anything the day after the election. So then you're. That kind of gives you sort of a September time frame, and then sort of a Christmas holiday gift uh, of something. But I think the bigger picture, Frank, is take a step back. Unless there is a credit market event, a la 2008, mm-hmm. or a pandemic, black swan, 2008. 2020 event, the reality is the Fed is probably in a range on interest rates between call it three and a half percent on the downside and five and a half to six percent on the upside for the next five to 10 years. That's the key. Mm -hmm. That's the key. The fact is that if you're buying stocks because you think the Fed is going back to zero percent on interest rates or you're selling stocks because you think the Fed is going to need to ramp interest rates to 10 percent, stop. We're finally in an environment where massive market manipulation by the Federal Reserve to move money in and out is probably come to an end, and they're going to get back to a normalized range of interest rates. And that's so healthy, right? Because then we go back to doing what you and I do and sharpening the pencil and saying, okay, a company is going to get multiple expansion because they're going to grow earnings because they're mm-hmm. doing X, Y, and Z, rather than you know what's the Fed going to do? And, and, and personally, I have no data to back this up, this point I'm just going to make. But I do believe that so much of the market has moved, if so many investors have moved to passive index investing, where they just own the S&P 500, or they own the triple Qs or something along those lines, that when you see people go on CNBC or Bloomberg or some of these other networks, and they're talking so much about what the Fed is doing, it's just an easy way to tell a story about why the stock market is going up or down, because you could blame it on the Fed, or you could say the Fed is action. The reality is it's earnings that drive stock prices, right? It's mm-hmm. earnings that drive and interest rates and inflation come second. So except if you're Tesla. <laughs> yeah, well, who, <laughs> it's, who it's amazing it? how much and we, we were on that, but it's amazing how much Tesla is going up. I mean, we, we did very well because sentiment was so bad. I love buying sentiment was so bad. Now, yeah. I mean, you're going up with margins coming down, earnings coming down, they're cutting prices. You don't, you, you haven't seen that, right? It's not like Meta's growing earnings. You're looking at, you know, all the Apple, Apple's like, you know, at least position themselves for AI that they're going to see a huge growth cycle with the, the the new 16 coming out. Uh, you know, Netflix is growing earnings. You know, you're right, earnings drive it, but it, it's interesting to see sometimes, uh, yeah, and some exceptions, but yeah, well, most of the time that. <laughs> well, well, we've been in a period here, you know, uh, Frank specifically, uh, this year specifically, where momentum has been so powerful as a factor where you just mm-hmm. pile on one after the other. And, you know, you start having people out there questioning if valuation matters because they keep seeing mm-hmm. stuff going to the True. right, up and to the right, and they throw the towel in. And that's when volatility is low and momentum drives winners higher and higher is when uh, people start lo- loosening the screws on their risk tolerance. And that's when Mm. issues happen. You know, there's a lot of shiny objects that are being dangled in the window once again, Frank. And 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 uh that's when, you know, my antenna goes up uh to 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 be more cautious and and more um uh patient uh in in terms of deploying capital for, you know, high quality stuff to become on sale. And and, and to be honest with you, that happened a lot in February and March. Where you know we've owned a lot of the AI names, and and for for our clients specifically at Tocqueville, we took some profits, and we were buying things in the basic material sector, uh, the commodity sector, which sold off way too much. Consumer staples, which people are flipped out over GLP ones, and, yeah, and, yeah. and 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 pricing coming down. Uh, some consumer discretionary type stuff. You know, high quality companies that sold off uh, because everyone else wanted these big AI plays. Uh, we were able to diversify, and 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 if you're playing for the long run, there's a, a tremendous amount of value there. Yeah, and people look at the markets. By the way, it's you, know, you look at the markets at all time highs. That's all people see. But you know, guys like right. us were looking under the hood. But you, you know, you look under the hood, you, you see the economy isn't as as great as it is, especially when uh, you know, you've seen a market at all time highs. And think of some of the stocks that have 52 week lows. You have Nike, you have Lululemon, yep. Yep. John Deere, right. uh, Las Vegas Sands. 
I mean, I mean, these are these are you know quality companies that that you know. Hey, the rota- it's all about rotation at the end of the day. And I guess that that's the next question I wanted to ask you because I love the way you put it when it came to the Fed, where you're like, look, it doesn't matter what they do, who cares? It's it's going to be between three and a half percent and five and a half percent. I love that, but there's a big difference between three and a half percent and five percent. So yeah, we're we're five. Over five percent banks, right? Banks are yeah. going to do fantastic net interest margin wide. Where lower, you're seeing you have a little more risk tolerance in terms of companies with debt. They're going to be able to lower their debt and their interest rate payments and stuff. Uh, you know, where do you see that? Uh, you know, how much the Fed's going to cut, and is that determined like how you're going to allocate uh, yeah. going forward? Because, uh, like I said, there is a big difference between three and a half percent and five and a half percent. If you see the Fed, you know, staying higher for longer, or you know, well, the question, the question is, y- yes, nominally there's a difference, meaning like from three and a half the numbers, but it's mm-hmm. it's what how, how fast do you get there, yeah. right? So my point behind that is, you know, don't buy stocks because you think the Fed is going to run to this side of the boat. Or run to that. Look, we we went we went in 2020, like you mentioned, the Fed cut interest rates to zero and bought back a quadrillion and you know bonds to make sure the credit markets don't lock up because we had COVID, right? And then we had the fastest raise in interest rates in modern monetary policy history, where you went mm-hmm. from zero to five and a half percent in what was it, 18 months or something like that. So my point is you should not see these extreme moves, which causes extreme movement in asset allocation. We're getting back to a certain level. And there are generations out there, a generation of investors that have no idea uh, of the, you know, there, there, you know, there's a generation of investors that have never seen a seven percent mortgage rate. There's a generation of investors that have never earned any money on their cash. They don't know what to, mm-hmm. they, they don't know what to make of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a generation of investors that all they have seen is tech and growth. Um, so you know you, you, you got to remember that you know that w- longer term there are other factors in play and and not only is it important though uh, that going back to my earlier comment that the Fed is probably not going to raise rates, but and again, it's moral hazard, I think, to what you're saying that if the Fed has to cut, uh, the Fed can now be in play if the credit markets do lock up. So, mm-hmm. for example, I'm not suggesting that's going to happen. Okay, mm-hmm. but if, so in 2022, when inflation was, you know, nine percent, mm-hmm. and the Fed was on their raise to to raising rates, God forbid. You know, uh, Silicon Valley Bank or some of these other, you know, you had a banking crisis in the summer of 2022 Mm -hmm. because how much would the Fed, how much more money printing would the Fed have been able to do without stoking inflation higher, right? It would have been Mm -hmm. really in a tough spot if you had, um, you know, a Lehman Brothers like scenario unfold in 2022 with inflation at 9%. Uh, That would have been really sticky. Now you don't have that, right? If there is a calamitous event, you have the moral hazard, the safety net uh, uh, of the Fed having to come in if they need to be. But I think we're back in an environment where mm-hmm. we're, we're going to be in a, a contained monetary policy range, and that's very healthy. Yeah, I mean, banks are more healthy than that I, I think I've ever seen in my thirty year career. I mean, the, the fact yeah. that the regulations are so good for the big banks really? that the more regulation because you can't. It's the only industry where you can't really have a, a smaller mid cap bank like penetrate that, right? And well, the, 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 it's just yeah. that the rules. It's just you can't get over hundred. That's what happened with with New York Community, right? They got over hundred billion assets, and what happened? That increased their ratios and wound up crashing the stock. So, but the latest stress test, you could see they have to be able to withstand all these basically at the same time a fifty five percent cut in, in the markets and equity markets, a forty percent decline in, in real estate. You know, this massive market where, where just you know you get a night GDP uh, negative GDP uh, of over eight percent, like conditions that we've never really saw since the Great Depression, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, to see how and what do they do after they pass stress test? They raise the dividends and then you know just the profit generation machine. But yeah, I definitely agree with you on that uh, in terms yeah, of yeah being. Yeah, I don't see you, that. You you bring up a good point, Frank, on regulation. This is a, a slight of a, t- a bit of a tangent, but. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, it's kind of the way I think about uh, banking and regulation. It's kind of like defensive schemes in the NFL. The NFL looks the football, National Football League looks to create crazy regulations. So there's more points put on the board because points make people excited, right? The more you could score. So they really hamstring defense. So you get really smart people to go out there and change defensive schemes until that starts working, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the banking system, which is massively regulated, right? So you're not going to have a large bank issue. But if you're an investor and you need financing, you start going to private lenders, Mm -hmm. right? So now you have this whole sort of, you know, shadow banking system going on 
uh, that are not regulated, right? Because JP Morgan is not allowed to make a loan or a Bank of America is not allowed to make a loan because of Citigroup not allowed to make a loan. Regional banks not allowed to make a loan because of regulation. So they're going to other parts of the market. And I don't know what to make of that, right? So if you have a severe recession, what then happens to all of these loans that have been made not through the regulated financial institutions. And I don't know, I I don't know, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, throw up a red flag or something, but there is another lending institution entities happening that are not currently being regulated to the way that the large and or regional banks are that has to take share. I mean, JP Morgan actually, uh, Jamie Dimon called it out on, uh, on, a, on a conference call once. And by the way, we own shares of JP Morgan uh, for our clients. And he said that, uh, you know, the, the private equity guys and the, the, the private banks, the private lending institutions are, are having a field day because the large banks can't write loans to yep. certain entities that want it. So they're mm -hmm. going elsewhere to get their money because they have to fund their own growth. So I just don't know what to make of that. And that's, again, uh, with volatility being low, um, you know, with, 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 with things being kind of quiet, despite all of the noise and a lot of things happening, you know, the antennas are up to see what's going on in the world. I, I, you know, things look okay right now. The economy does appear to be weakening. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is just because the stock market, market cap weighted S and P 500 has been up and to the right strongly since, uh, Halloween of 2023 doesn't mean anyone should be sitting on their laurels. So let's get to the fun part, okay, in terms of investing. Say if I'm a client, I don't know what your, your, your the minimum is for, for a client in Tocqueville. Say if it's, you know, whatever, 100000 whatever it is. If I come in and I'm a new client, how do you allocate, uh, you know, where would you talk about international, but not just allocate because, okay, fine, you're putting it to large cash. So, but where are you going overweight right now over mm. the next, like, you know, six months into the election and maybe, yeah. you know, like, like a 12 month outlook, if that's how you look at it. Like 12 months is how I'm going to position this client that comes in with, with the average risk tolerance, right? If yeah. it's a 90 year old person, it's going to be a lot different Honestly. than a 30 year old. But, but the average person, you know, where do you see the pockets that you're like, hey, next 12 months look really good here? Yeah. So, so the public service announcement that I'd make on this is, you know, we take a step back and we figure out, OK, what are you looking to achieve? You know, you, you every, every no two clients are the same. Everyone has different relationships to money. Everyone has different income needs, risk tolerance, time horizon, tax situation. Right. So we figure that all out. And then we say within that, our team manages six different strategies, uh, all long only, all liquid. Uh, all on public markets, and we figure out, okay, how much do you need in domestic or or uh, core equity? How much do you need in taxable or tax exempt bonds? What do you want international, small, mid cap, thematic? And then we have a, an enhanced income strategy where we're looking to get income first, growth second, right? Mm -hmm. So usually a client is some mixture of those six to some degree, where there's some sort of capital appreciation, long duration, preservation, income generation. Uh, so it really depends on the client. And like I said, very different than 2020, 21, or 22, uh, we're, we're feeling more comfortable adding to bonds today because we know we don't have to take on much risk to get income. Uh, we, we started our enhanced income strategy in 2010 and 2011 because the bond market just stunk. And we knew interest rates were going to go up. We knew bonds would be running into the wind. So we created this other strategy to, to do that. So there'd be a combination of bonds and some income. And then on the equity side, uh, we're definitely favoring international. Uh, we're definitely favoring, again, these developed non-US type companies. We have a lot of the high quality tech uh, stocks for sure. These are real companies, unlike 2000, um, you know, the... You know the the companies that are leading the growth charge do generate a lot of cash flow. Do generate a lot of free cash flow. They have learned their lesson from the dot com play for sure. They are buying back a lot of stock. They are reinvesting for growth. So there's a lot of good stuff going on there. We're mindful of where valuations are, so we just weight them differently than say where the market is. Um, and then you know we're adding a lot to commodities. We think that um, the market has really underestimated. Uh, war. The mm -hmm. market has really underestimated the amount of debt that the U.S. has on its balance sheet. You know, uh, the the interest expense that the U.S. will pay from its budget 
just on bonds rolling off and what the government has to buy at today's levels is enormous. Mm -hmm. So if you think of like, uh, you know, what are the biggest expenses from the government? Social Security, Medicare, defense spending, and then other, right? Interest expense will now crowd out that tremendously. So how do you cover that interest expense? You have to buy more, raise taxes, or cut spending from elsewhere. Guess what, Frank? You're never going to cut Social Security spending. You're never going to cut Medicare spending. Are you really going to cut defense spending when there's war going on all over the place and we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're involved in it? Probably not. So how, so you got to fund the expense, the interest expense elsewhere. So from that standpoint, gold is very attractive to us. I know gold has had we we've owned we we typically own gold for our client portfolios. We raised our rate in gold, our weight in gold and client portfolios in January of 2023. Spot gold or, or are you going into stocks? So no, and uh, so uh spot gold um yeah. uh in our equity sense. strategy and in our income strategy, individual stocks because the price of gold is is, is so high, uh the miners are making a lot of money and they're they're paying out dividends. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get gold with an income play there, which is attractive for us, despite the fact that the miners have stunk relative yeah. to spot gold over the past decade. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's funny when you look at the, the miners too, it's it's if you look at their market caps, their market caps are, uh, are higher than they were back right. then. The stock prices yeah. are cut in half because of the massive dilution that they've seen for, for you know over the past 10 years, the massive dilution. So, I mean, even some of the big guys, you know, so, so it's amazing yep. when you look at dilution, people are like, well, you know, the stocks haven't performed market cap wise, they have. But stock price, no, because you're increasing the share count, you know, by, by a ton, right? right. So, so it's interesting if you look at some of the ones that haven't done that. Those are the ones that that are, are fifty two week highs. Yeah, you know, earlier this year, again, when the AI craze and the equity market sort of took its second level higher, you know, the Chat GPT end of two thousand twenty two was sort of the first leg, and then the end of last year was sort of the second leg, or the beginning of this year was sort of a second leg, in my opinion. We were buying a lot of commodities. So uh, commodity miners, commodity related companies, so copper, fertilizer, mm -hmm. uh, we thought the uh, utility space, uh, which which I haven't been a fan of in in a very, very long time because I thought investors were overpaying for the dividend yield, was finally got to an attractive standpoint uh, because people are overly focused on where interest rates were relative to where uh, utilities are. So we found value there. And now you have everyone jumping on this board. Uh, the board of this AI, uh, yes. energy, infrastructure, utility, mm -hmm. electricity type play, which is gravy for us because, um, you know, we assume the grid, regardless of who the administrator is, that you're going to have this continuation of building out the grid and refining the grid because, um, you know, because because of uh, of sort of themes that are out there in terms of data centers and AI and, and, and things. And, and the U.S. electric grid is just old and needs replacement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, think that the uh, uh, GLP-1 story, which you probably, which you, you've spoken about on, has wreaked havoc this time last year on the consumer products goods. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of overdone. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think GLP-1s are here to stay for sure? Uh, do you think that uh, that will gain market share? Do you think that if the healthcare providers uh, start compensating the the drug the prices for GLP ones. It's game set match. You're going to see that thing go through oh, the yeah. roof. Oh, yeah. um, uh, but I do I do think some of the the, the food company uh, stocks have probably sold off a bit too. So a long way to way of saying is those high quality non AI related type companies we were we were loading up on earlier in the year for sure. Yeah, you know, healthcare come now. I think about it. I mean, UNH is going to report. Uh, but um, pretty soon. But you know, just that whole industry hasn't been doing too well. But it has not. Health healthcare, healthcare is really attractive. Uh, yeah, if I was one of those companies, healthcare. I would announce that I'm covering the the the, the weight loss drugs. Just announce you're gonna have 10 million people sign up for them right away. I mean, they're paying yeah, five six hundred dollars for this. I mean, it's twelve hundred. They get they get you know a special card or whatever. But insurance isn't covered. They're paying five hundred dollars, and they're running to pay five hundred dollars because they're probably saving that in the amount of food that they they used to buy. Yeah, and that's how good know, these not, things are working. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm not a specialist on the the healthcare providers, but presumably, mm -hmm. you know, there's two sides of the coin. There's the, the insurers and there's the drug providers. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 at the end of the day, you know, capitalism rules, and it's, you know, at what margin level um, are the drug providers willing to, you know, come down on their price to make sure that their their profit targets are met? Because if they're selling them now at full price, you know, why bother cutting a deal? Uh, yeah. unless it's unless unless they can make the numbers work and yeah. i think ultimately the numbers will be made to work
Yeah. You know, I, I really, really miss talking to you because yeah. you know, we don't do anything script. Like you, I say, Hey, what topics you want to touch? You know, it's, you know, cause we'll talk about certain topics that we, that are really strong to us right now. You'll be like, okay, you know, fed and you, but we, we really go everywhere and anywhere. It just makes it cool because there's really no direction. You'll see me looking down and writing a question down because I'm just feeding off of you saying, Oh, yeah. that's good. I want to follow up on this, but I, I love it. And, and that, I, I guess a couple more questions here. I love you. Yeah. You're giving us that, that much of your time, but um, do you have any allocation of Bitcoin now? The ETFs got approved or you're just like, okay, gold is, is what we're looking for out of that investment. And, and yeah, have you thought about that at, at all? Sure. So for my team specifically at Tocqueville, mm -hmm. uh, we have a strategy that's called small and mid cap and thematic. And it's usually a, a, a long duration diversifier to overall portfolio. So for example, if a typical client has about 50% of their portfolio in a core equity strategy, maybe 25% in bonds, you know, 15% in our enhanced income, uh, that gets you to about 80%. Maybe it's 10% of their portfolios in our small and mid cap and 10% international, something like that. Within the thematic portion, we have a very small position in Ethereum. Uh, and we've had that for mm -hmm. a couple of years now. Uh, and it's not necessarily the Bitcoin uh, uh, and Ethereum is a you know the trust uh, and, and I own it personally. Mm -hmm. And it's again, a very, very small position um, and probably pretty big you know, now if you own it for a couple of years. Yeah. The, the, the <laughs> idea behind it is the idea behind it is, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, a platform, not necessarily, I, you know, we don't subscribe to the Bitcoin being digital gold from that standpoint, but mm -hmm. because it's hard to value. So the idea behind Ethereum is that it's a platform, right. Of which, uh, you can make money off of because people, if other tokens are going to work off of the platform, they got to pay you to do it. If you're going to do things like DeFi, uh, decentralized finance and things like that, you pay for that. Uh, so there's a business model behind it, but clearly it's a very frank, when I say it's a, it's like a very, very small position of 10%, you know what I mean? So, yeah. uh, because we understand the, the, the volatility behind yeah. it. We understand, uh, you know, this is still a very new technology, but again, it's in a thematic long duration and it has to be sued with the right client. So a lot of disclaimers there saying, um, you know, you know, speak to your financial advisor before you go out and, uh, and, yeah. and start investing in that stuff. Yeah, but it's good. It's good to expand into that because you see the demand for it, right? I mean, the younger generation from 45 uh, and, and younger has grew up like in the digital revolution, right? Everything's digital to them. Right. So, so, so you're looking at gold and I feel like, you know, you know, it's, you know, this great investment, but it's, it's been pitched for such a long time. And mm -hmm. whether you think about it or I think about it, you brought up a good point, you know, with the government where you have like the, the moral hazard, you, we don't like that, that the government's there, but yeah. they are going to be there if something, yeah. if something's crazy. And you got to factor that into your analysis, right? Like, oh, okay. If this happens, but you know, when it comes to, to Bitcoin, they look at it like, you know, the older generation looks at gold and, and you mm. can't ignore that, like demand mm. and how they feel and the government spending and stuff like that. It's just interesting when you see totally. it's more than just, oh, this speculative asset. It's, it's, you know, being in that industry and talking to these people like, like, you know, the holding young people holding an investment forever just is, is a concept that you usually don't see either. Right. They want to make profits right away. It's just, yeah. you know, it's kind I, of crazy, I, right? I, I, I think, Frank, you've come up with a book idea on the generational viewpoint yeah. of cryptocurrency because it is bifurcated yeah. right it is very much mm -hmm. you kind of get it uh you 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 believe in it and and you have you 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 believe in the narrative uh and it and the technology behind it or you don't because it was you know sort of fabricated uh by somebody and no one really even knows and and and, and you you have you have massive skepticism mm -hmm. so uh you know for me uh, one of the tales of, I think, the whole crypto world has come out of the war and the, uh, the, the sanctions placed on, uh, on Russia, Russia and some of these yeah. other ones. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if your traditional means of moving money have been blocked off, you're again, the same analogy of a defensive coordinator of an NFL team. If the government is, if, 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 the, if the commissioner is telling you we want to score more points, and your job is to come up with a defensive scheme to stop the other team from scoring more points. You got to come up with a scheme. So same here. If, if if you're no longer allowed to move money in traditional methods, you're going to have to find ways to move money. Um, and and 
and and and and it looks like the crypto market allows for that. So yeah, I mean, there's such a disruption there with the SWIFT system too. That you bring it up. I mean, that that wasn't on the table to take Russia. Yeah, that's the right. SWIFT. That was a big surprise, and that's why you see. I mean, there's you see de-dollarization. A dollar is always going to remain the reserve currency, but you see it like shifting, right? And it's it's, it's almost like you're using your analogy of football. It's almost like telling one team, "Hey, you're not allowed to pass anymore. You can only run." The rest yeah. of the team's like, whoa, what happens if that happens to us? You know, we better get a couple yeah. more running backs. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's it, right. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. Like like that change that that really was 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 it was difference maker, which which they, is crazy. But yeah. again, there, there are certain generational things that are being shaken up. You know, think about the oil market. You know where the, the 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 Saudis were selling oil to the Chinese in they're going around the dollar, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Russians in India had their own. Uh, you know, sort of a transport of oil uh, going non-U.S. dollar, right? So um, even if they're experimenting with uh, those means, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is what it is. They're experimenting with it, and 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 you know, it's something to be mindful of. Again, another reason why, uh, ironically, that we're coming talking about crypto, and you make your comments about gold. Why gold is one of the largest positions in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, we think gold is we is is very attractive. If the Fed does reduce rates and and that's beneficial for gold, the debt situation on the U.S. balance sheet is beneficial for gold. Um, the amount of gold that central banks has been buying Incredible. and storing, like, yeah. yep. again, it keeps the probably keeps the price of gold higher. So, um, you know, all all, all of those things scream attractive to gold for us. Uh, okay, so so last part here before I let you go is the election. Mm. Uh, there's a big difference in who gets elected, right? In yep. terms of sectors that are going to work. And one of the things I see, where you could say, okay, well, Trump's definitely taking a lead after after the debate, which we I think you know, which is factual, you know, if you're looking at every poll. Uh, but there is going to be a significant difference in terms of, of regulation, I think, especially when it comes to, to mergers and acquisitions, where where I see a company like you know Spirit Airlines and JetBlue trying to merge, and they didn't mm -hmm. allow it because they're like, mm -hmm. well, it's it's going to create less competition and you're going to raise mm -hmm. prices. But now you're looking at you know Spirit actually on the verge of, of you know Chapter Eleven. I mean, kind of, they're working with creditors because you know they're in trouble. Maybe they get out of it with creditors. It might be easier to go Chapter Eleven, just like every single airline has done in the past. If you look at Delta American Airlines, whatever, but. Yeah, you know, now you could see some of these deals getting done where I feel like every deal, no matter what it is, even Microsoft buying Activision, right? I mean, I, I'm not, it, it's, just, it's like you just said it, didn't even look. They're like, no. I mean, so if we do get Trump in, uh, you know, what do you see differently? Because it is, I would think that has to result in certain areas, especially like oil and drilling and maybe climate change, alternative energy and stuff, and, and, and even merging acquisitions. Is there like a big shift in allocation or it's like, hey, we're well positioned either way, which you may be because there's some sectors that obviously are really not going to matter no matter who is uh, hmm. who gets elected. So I, I think first, the first thing is uh, elections around the world. There were 40 major elections this year and or there will be. And before we talk about U.S., you have to talk about basically the referendum on the leader in India. Uh, you had the, the 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 issues going on in France where there's a referendum on uh, – and the far left is taking uh, issue in um, over in, in France. Um, you had uh, – so you have massive amounts of – there is a, a new president in Mexico. Uh, so the point behind all that is whatever status quo may have been is being changed because you have you have a new leader in, in Italy that came on last year. So uh, you have more extreme views left and right coming to the global stage that will affect global economic policy. It's not just about the U.S. And I, I think it's important for investors to recognize that, that you have massive change in uh, economic trade and flow uh, because of that. It, it, it causes ma a major policy changes. But if we focus on the U.S. specifically, it's really hard to handicap. Um, you know, m and activity, maybe you see a rush in more m and leading up to uh, the election. Mm -hmm. Get it in now because we don't know what the outcome is going to be. You don't know mm – -hmm who the Democratic candidate yeah. may or may not no, be. No, you don't know. Yeah, it's a you long really, time to November. It's a long time. You really don't mm -hmm. know what, what to make. Um, the M&A and the oil patch has been going on for 15 months now. Yeah. So whether 
Trump is reelected or someone else, I don't see that changing because, you know, basically you have a land grab amongst the U.S. oil guys because – you know, uh, oil wells are depleting. You got to buy more land with more wells, and you got to figure out an alternative energy strategy because that's ultimately where the world is moving. So you're going to see more consolidation in with the uh, with the um, uh, on the oil patch. Hard to tell what happens on the bank side of things. Um, you know, the government has tried to prevent too big to fail, but. You know, when the banks were going down in March of last year, who did Janet Yellen call up? <laughs> you know, she called yeah. the big banks and said, "Hey, can you take some of these off our plate because we don't want an issue in the credit market and they create more too big to fail." So, um, you, you know, uh, at the end of the day, oh, and by the way, let's not forget about the impact on interest rates. Money is not yeah. free; it is expensive. Typically, leverage is involved to to do deals. You're seeing more stock for stock type of deals. Uh, rather than going the credit markets. So uh, where are interest rates at that's at a certain point in time when companies want to do uh, deals? What's their cost to finance the deal? So a lot of factors involved. Um, you know, under the current administration, Lena Khan came in as a massive uh, uh, hard line stop to further consolidation. And you know what, Frank, ultimately deals got done. Mm-hmm. There were there were just a handful of deals that may have spooked the overall M&A market. But at the end of the day, if things were delayed and lawyers got paid more money and investor bankers got paid more money because of the delay, at the end of the day, the deals got done. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I ultimately don't see that much of an issue. It's hard to really handicap, you know, the biggest issue is obviously taxes coming into the election because yeah. the Trump's tax bill sunsets in 25. Mm-hmm. So odds are, if he gets reelected, uh, or if he's elected again, he's going to extend those. Mm-hmm. How we pay for it is another story, mm-hmm. but yep. most likely that's going to get extended. Democratic candidate comes in and, and wins, and they end the sunset. You know th- that's an impact. You know, do they mm-hmm. raise rates on the corporate tax rate? Uh, you know, that's not going to help stock price as much because it makes mm-hmm. earnings go down if corporate taxes go up. So. It's really tricky. Unlike 2016, I think, where you had a clear understanding of the agendas for Trump and you had a clear understanding for the agendas of Hillary Clinton at the time, you could kind of see what sectors uh, would benefit and what wouldn't. It was crazy, Uh, right? 2007, I remember, because when Trump got elected, I remember the market came down a lot, right? People were worried, and all of a sudden, boom, it's just like- The market came down for like six hours. (laughs) It was like, It it was like at nine (laughs) o'clock when they started announcing, you know, the the outcome or whenever it was, 10, 11 Mm o'clock, the markets, the intraday, the futures sold off aggressively to about four or five in the morning. And then everyone's like, all right, well, maybe this, (laughs) maybe maybe companies are going to make a lot of money now. And you sort of had a rally and and, and Mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, 2020, you know, we had uh, you know the spending on with interest rates at zero was a the the agenda was you know spend big on infrastructure. We got to you know the U.S. infrastructure is falling apart. Guess what? Whether you like it or not, Biden has definitely came through on that. There is a mm-hmm. lot of money being spent. Part of the reason why the economy has been as strong as it has been is been because of government funding to support um, you know infrastructure spending. There's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's hard to outside of social issues like immigration and, and things like that. It is really hard to see where because uh, Trump is entering this election in a very different tone and a very different manner on his agenda than he did in 2016. Didn't accept and crypto. I, he accepts crypto now. Again, it's and, a lot of positioning for votes, too. Right. It's, it's 100 yeah, percent. You know, outside yep. of taxes and immigration, mm-hmm. it's hard to see where Trump comes out. And you don't even you don't mm-hmm. know outside of continuing the narrative on the Democratic side of following through on inflation and green energy and all that stuff. You don't know what if Biden is going to be the candidate and or if who the replacement is, what their agenda is going to be. So it's it's tricky. It's very, very tricky to invest purely on what uh, the U.S. election uh, is going to be. That's why, you know, try to focus on company fundamentals. That's that's the best yeah. thing you could do at this point in time. Yeah, it's a tough question. That's why I asked you, Young. You know everything, so yeah. I know it's a tough question. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't say anything. I just gave that question to you. Let you go. So. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, my, my my goal, Frank, is to come up with a 
reasonable answer that has reasonable probability around it because the reality is none of us know we're just no. trying to do the best we can right yeah, that's, that's, the odds that's are not favor as much as we can so that, speaking of odds of, no go ahead i'm sorry no god that was it, no, it. Uh, yes yeah, so, so at the end of the interview and i have to ask you a question this is this probably the most important part of the interview um, all right have i'm gonna say yes is the answer to the question have you started looking at fantasy football yet it is july august you're gonna hear a lot about it right I haven't. And and here's the reason, Frank. <laughs> Last year, I changed the investment process a little bit towards my uh, fantasy. Because usually, you're right, dead on, I'd have the Trapper Keeper out, and I'd be uh, breaking down the spreadseets. Did you I'd win be... last year with your league? I In the 22 years that I've been in my fantasy league, I scored the highest cumulative points that anyone has ever scored. Got the buy. I had a couple of players get injured and I lost in the semifinal round, yeah. which is that's where the luck, you know, that's why I like There's investing a lot of luck investing. Yeah. You got to play the long game. And if yep. you're, you're worried about day-to-day movements, you know, it, you, you, you see, so I did the least amount of research that I ever did on fantasy <laughs> and I scored the highest points that I've ever yep. done. Yep. So I'm going pure growth. And my strategy is take the best player at that moment in the draft that I could find rather that than playing position. value. Yep. And, and, and that's, that's where I'm going with it. So no, my keeper is I took Jordan love in a 13th nice. round last year nice. and you keep one player and you select that pick. Mm-hmm. So I think that's who oh, my yeah. keeper is going to be. Cause I don't give anybody up for it. Right. 13th round. Who 13th cares? round. That's amazing. Keeping that. Yeah, right. So, cool. so I think that's where, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that's where I'm at. See so. the important issues, right? These are the important stuff. Exactly. So, so. We exactly have sons. Right. I have daughter. One of my daughters actually into football, so I can do fantasy with them. Oh, nice. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, have you, you know, done that? I've done a couple of uh, father-son leagues, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, um, yeah. This is going to be the first one I do with her. So okay. she, I throw the football. She throws a football. This is my youngest one, my eighth grader. She throws a football. Yeah. She throws a rocket spiral. I can't, I, don't, I, can't, I can barely throw a spiral now. She throws a spiral. I'm like, she's there like, let's play football. I'm like, football? Really? I was like, all right. Yeah. The, the rotator cuff isn't what it used to be, Frank. No. You watch that now. We're at that age where oh, uh, you got to be careful. I think I passed that age, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but, but John, listen, thank you so much. We have to have you on again. Uh, I mm-hmm. love having you on. We go anywhere, like I said, with, with, with subjects. And, and I know my audience loves you because you always provide really good ideas, good sectors, ideas, and stuff like that. And you've been right a lot. You have a great track record, especially coming on this podcast. So I really appreciate it. If someone wants to get in touch with you, Tocqueville, how can they? Uh, what's the easiest yep. way? Well, uh, go to Tocqueville.com, T-O-C-Q-U-E-V-I-L-L-E.com. Mm-hmm. You could find me and my teammates on there along with the rest of Tocqueville. would love to engage with uh, anyone who, who could be interested to help you out. If we could answer some questions, that'd be great. And read our commentaries. It's all there open for the public to, to take advantage of. Uh, love being a guest on the show, Frank. I could sit here. We could do this all day long. Uh, thank you for having me back on again. Congrats on the success. You know, Frank and I were talking before I got on, you know, we've known each other for almost 10 years now. Uh, but I was listening to Frank before I became a guest in 2011. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, Frank has been a, you know, there's, there's a lot of podcasts out there, but Frank has been a pioneer in the, you have been a pioneer in the podcast world for sure. And it's a credit to you and your loyal, you know, viewers, right? I mean, clearly you're doing something right. If you have the longevity that you have in this industry and in the podcast world, uh, because you were doing stuff before anyone else was, you were, I remember at the time, cause I had a long commute and I was like, I gotta, you know, there's gotta be a podcast out there somewhere that has, that's talking stocks. And you were the only one out there. Everyone else was technicians or, you mm-hmm. know, save for your 529, some sort of financial planning thing. So, um, and I was like, you know what, this guy knows what he's talking about. So, um, uh, so credit to you. And again, thanks for having me on. Cause I love being a guest on the show. I appreciate that. I was just letting you go, man. That's cool. Yeah. I'm humbled. <laughs> no, I'm seriously, I'm humbled. Thank you. And, and really, I, it, it's about guests too. And having great guests on. So that, that makes the audience, you know, tune in even more. And I'm thankful for that. So yeah. thanks so much for coming on and, uh, really hopefully you join us again. Definitely join us again. Absolutely. Soon. Thanks, Frank. Thanks. See you. Great stuff from John. Like I said, I'm going to have a, a lot more interviews going forward, getting responses from, some big names now, and that's thanks to you. I think we're over 15, 16 million total downloads uh, in over 100 countries. And now in today's world, there's thousands of investment podcasts, right? So it's hard to separate. If you reach out to, say, a new guest and say, hey, I want you on a podcast, they're probably getting that request by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And they're like, oh, and the first thing they do is they're going to do their due diligence. I do the same thing. When someone asks me, I try to help out other podcasts because I'm one of the first that's ever done a podcast in the investment sector. I've been doing this for 15 years. 
uh, and you always want to help people out. But sometimes, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, it's the right person that you're going on and, and it's the right demographic and stuff and making sure that it can help you out, obviously. Uh, but when they see those numbers, it's easy to get a lot of guests on, especially if they're promoting a book or marketing or something, uh, you know, kind of what you see on late night shows, right? So most of the guests are going to be uh, people that are promoting a movie or something and, you know, get some analysis from these people and stuff, which is going to be fantastic. But uh, some really high profile guests I'm going to start putting in front of you and uh, not, not just guests that uh, have the same opinion as me. It's not what we want. It's how, how are they going to challenge us? How are we going to learn from them? I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, I don't care what you are. It, it's... You know, you want to be fair. I wanted those interviews to be really great. Uh, I never believed in, in interviews where you're fighting back and forth and you're arguing and, and I have a strong opinion and telling the guy, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, I'm even open to getting Peter Schiff on. I would like to get Peter Schiff on and really talk. I mean, I kind of harsh on him sometimes to get pissed off, but look, he's, he's marketing his company and stuff. So, uh, But I really want to get some, some great people in front of you uh, and I'm going to do that a lot more. We did that a lot in the past and went away from it, but now we're going to get some more interviews. So uh, anybody that you think, I said this last week, they think it would be a great fit. They could be a CEO. They could be uh, an industry specialist. They could be an analyst, economist, a doctor, uh, you know, following certain trends. But, you know, of course, I look at these people as well, but I think they're going to be a good fit and we're all going to learn from them. Uh, those are sometimes the best guests, right? I know uh, in the podcast world and even CNBC, I feel like, you know, whatever guest is on, you know exactly what they're going to say. They're going to be bullish on the markets, right? Tom Lee's going to be bullish on the markets. We're going to see people who are bearish on the markets, right? So you're going to have perma bears. <laughs> You know, for me, I, I want to bring out something that is different. And you do that by doing your research on these interviews, right? You do your research of everything they said over the last three, four months. Sometimes I'll go back even a year, uh, but try to get even more out of them. But sometimes I feel like there's not a lot of value in bringing on someone that's just going to sit, they're, they're going to talk their book and it's the same book they talked about for 20, 30 years. Uh, you know, we want value now. Trends change every single day. Every day now with technology. So again, we want to get some good people out there. I know with this network that we have, uh, which is fantastic, over 100,000 people, uh, you know, again, feel free. If you feel like someone's a great guest, email me, frankcurseyresearch.com. And, uh, you know, if I think they're a good fit, I'll definitely, definitely interview. So with that said, it's it for me. And I'll see you guys tomorrow on Wall Street Unplugged Premium. Take care. Love this episode of Wall Street Unplugged. I think you'll really love Wall Street Unplugged Premium. The Wall Street Plus Premium is my members-only podcast where I dive even deeper into this week's events. Well, I'll do even more than tell you what's moving these markets. I'll tell you specifically what moves you can make today. So this is going to be about trading. Put big money in your pocket right away due to the inconsistencies I see daily in the market. I'm talking about specific investment ideas I'm recommending and tracking each week that I believe will be impacted directly by everything I just talked about today. Plus, you're going to get the chance to go even further down the rabbit hole with me and my co-host, who's Daniel Creech, as we discuss which of these week's trends could turn into massive windfalls. Could the big trends that we see lurking on the horizon, also the news we're picking up from our network of insiders, which has gotten bigger and bigger thanks to you and so many people listening to this podcast in over 100 countries. And you'll get a chance to talk to me directly in my special Ask Me Anything Q&A session. All of that and a lot more, like premium interviews with world leaders in finance, technology, industry, and politics. This is all part of Wall Street Unplugged Premium. And becoming a member is super simple and super cheap. So head on over to WSUoffer.com to check it all out. Sign up today and you won't miss a thing. That's WSUoffer.com. Wall Street Unplugged is produced by Curzio Research, one of the most respected financial media companies in the industry. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility.